intersection of Reno Road and Military Road is one boundary of what supporters hoped would become the Chevy Chase Historic District. But now D.C.'s Historic Preservation Office has ruled it will not move forward with a plan. The office says there was not community consensus. Proponents said the historic designation was needed to protect Chevy Chase's small town in a big city field. But opponents said making Chevy Chase more inclusive was more important and that Chevy Chase doesn't have a particular architectural style that requires preservation.
This hearing will come to order. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to today's Joint Economic Committee hearing titled Building Blocks for Success, Investing in Early Childhood Education. Today's hearing will begin with five minute opening statements from myself, from the Vice Chairman, and each of our four witnesses. Uh, we'll then proceed to questions alternating between parties in the order of member arrival. And members are reminded to keep their questions to no more than five minutes. Uh, now for opening statements, this Congress, this committee has repeatedly discussed how important it is to invest in our nation's kids and their families. Time and again, our witnesses have reiterated how investing in kids strengthens our economy immediately and long into the future. Today, we're focusing specifically on the economic benefits of early childhood education. The data clearly shows that having access to affordable and reliable early child care, childhood education unlocks benefits for parents, for their kids, and for the economy. Many of our own personal experiences back this up. Affordable early childhood education makes it easier for parents and caregivers to work, to afford groceries and rent, and to save for retirement. In total, researchers estimate that inaccessible child care costs uh, anywhere between $8.3 and $78 billion, billion with a B, in lost wages each year. High quality pre-K also helps kids do better in school later in life and can even improve their future job prospects. And when parents can keep working without having to worry about providing childcare themselves, businesses don't have to spend time and money hiring and training their replacements. This could save companies billions of dollars every year. Federal investments in early childhood education also keep child care centers open and raise wages for child care workers. The benefits of accessible and affordable child care pay off long into the future with higher lifetime earnings, better outcomes for many kids who participated in early childhood education, and this in turn leads to a stronger workforce economy and revenue base at the local, state, and federal levels, all while driving down spending on social services. Unfortunately, right now, this win-win scenario rem remains out of reach, and that's because the current private market for early childhood education simply cannot and is not meeting the needs of most families. As of 2018, more than half of people in the United States lived in a child care desert where slots fall alarmingly short of demand, resulting in long wait lists and high prices. Families are currently spending an average of 10% of their income on childcare, despite the fact that the Department of Health and Human Services recommends no more than 7%. Government funding and support for these programs is essential for our country and our economy to reap the maximum benefits of early childhood education. While investments in the American Rescue Plan help bring down the cost of care for families and support child care workers, that funding was obviously temporary. And I've repeatedly advocated for more federal child care funding, but Congress has yet to meet this growing need. Because of this inaction, it's largely been up to states to lead the way on guaranteeing affordable early childhood education. Today we'll hear about uh, more about how we fought to lead the way in New Mexico, setting the standard when it comes to providing accessible childcare and pre-K for every family. That journey started over 10 years ago when families and advocates in New Mexico fought to amend our state constitution to tap into our land grant permanent fund so we could deliver the benefits of early childhood education to every single one of our kids. I was proud to be the first of New Mexico's federal elected leaders to support this effort. And after over 70% of New Mexicans voted for it in 2022, I was proud to lead the effort to secure the congressional approval that was required to put this program into action. As a result, funding for early childhood education in New Mexico is going up by roughly $150 million per year. New Mexico has also implemented the Early Childhood Trust Fund to further ensure sustainable funding. These new funds are still getting out the door, but already research is showing the benefits for families and providers. That includes early results from research done by the Cradle to Career Policy Institute at the University of New Mexico. 
They found that the early childhood education expansion in New Mexico is making it possible for parents to return to the careers that they put on hold in order to stay home with their children. Some are starting their own businesses or returning to school or putting the savings towards buying a house. Parents are reporting less stress and better mental health. And this is helping providers too. 43% of childcare providers were able to increase staff wages. 63% were able to improve facilities and 59% report increased quality of care. When all is said and done, nearly all families in New Mexico will ultimately have access to free childcare and early education, helping them to cover other important expenses and invest in their futures. For families in New Mexico with infants in center-based care, these savings would cover over seven months of the median rent or over half of the average down payment on a house in our state. That's life-changing for families and our economy now and into the future. At the federal level, we are far from the standard New Mexico has set, but we have made good investments in federal tax credits and programs that help families recoup certain child care expenses. Programs like the Child Tax Credit, the Child and Dependent Care Credit, and the Child Care and Development Block Grant allow families to offset or subsidize the costs of raising a child. The Biden administration is also doing its part passing a landmark executive order supporting the care economy last year and taking important steps to boost wages for Head Start workers and cut the cost of on-base childcare for military families. And certain grants from the CHIPS Act require recipients to show how they'll provide childcare to their workers, making sure that our investments in new manufacturing don't leave parents behind. Treasury Secretary Yellen has described the childcare market as a textbook case of a broken market. I would agree with that. But if we can build momentum, we can get this market working, all while helping get parents back to work as well. I'm looking forward to hearing more from our witnesses today about how investing in early childhood education can help the United States boost labor force participation and invest in future generations. And I'll now turn over to uh, the Vice Chairman, Chairman Schweikert, for his opening statement. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. Um, when you and I were young, for every $6 that was spent on a child, there was $1 spent on seniors. Today, that is reversed. And by the end of this decade, it will be $1 for child, $8 for those over 65. It is our demographics that are moving, that are consuming much of these resources. Where I have concern and where we want to be intellectually robust and honest and also looking at some of the testimony here, so please help me through this. We're trying to understand, do, you, do we conflate universal pre-K with child care? Are they different things? Do they have different requirements, different models? If so, I'm, we need some answers on some of the data. Um, some of the, uh, it's still preliminary, so it's not been well vetted coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act that it actually in spots, it actually increased the cost of actual child care for those who were not in one of the subsidized systems. The second thing is I wish to understand, particularly when our friends from New Mexico, which I'm very interested in what you've been doing, being from a state that also has a land trust very similar to you, is some of your statistics on, as you've been growing your populations, why this substantial spike in post-COVID absenteeism. Is it a sampling error? Is it that you're reaching more or wealthier families that have alternatives? Help us understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, the, the other obs observation here is help us also have quality data and literature. We dug into a number of the academic articles. Some of them are more than almost a decade old and have truly contradictory information. You know, we all remember the quotes from an article, what, seven, eight years ago, saying on year three, we don't see the same statistical evidence of progress. And then almost one from the same era saying the complete opposite. Help us. Is there something that's much more recent, post-COVID? Um, and also, the last thing I will share, as we go into a population where U.S. fertility rates have substantially collapsed, the United States um, last year, the best estimate is not final, is 1.63. We are now below much of Western Europe. 
There is not a single study that actually shows of policy other than buying people houses in, um, what is it, Hungary, and that barely moved numbers. So in that case, how do we have as high a quality next generation who are prepared for the skill sets that are required? Is this the path, or should we actually think much more creatively with the resources we have and the understanding of the pressures our demographics are gonna create on those resources? And with that, I yield back. Now I'd like to introduce our four distinguished witnesses. Speaker Javier Martinez is the New Mexico State Representative from District 11 and serves as the 31st Speaker of the New Mexico House of Representatives. In his nine years in the legislature, Speaker Martinez has led the fight to build a more inclusive economy. This work has included expanding the New Mexico Working Families Tax Credit, making it one of the most generous and inclusive in the country, and championing the New Mexico Child Tax Credit. Speaker Martinez was also integral in the effort to amend the state constitution to invest additional money from our state's land grant permanent fund in early childhood education. Speaker Martinez has been a tireless advocate for New Mexico's community for more than two decades. Ms. Melissa Botea is the Vice President for Income Security and Child Care and Early Learning at the National Women's Law Center overseeing the organization's advocacy, policy, and public education strategies to ensure that all women and families have the income and supports that they need to thrive. Prior to joining the NWLC, Ms. Botea spent nearly a decade at the Center for American Progress, where she founded and led the Poverty to Prosperity program, establishing projects to uplift the voices of low-income communities. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I'll hand it over to you to introduce the other two witnesses. Oddly enough, I don't have a script. So do you have it in front of you? Actually, I don't. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Hold on. Let's, Let's see if I do. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Great. I would like to introduce our two distinguished witnesses. There we go. Um, Lindsay M. Burke, PhD, is the director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation, where she oversees research and policy on issues related to preschool, K through 12, higher education reform. She was appointed to serve on Governor York Yonkin's um, leading, landing team for education. Um, Ms. Ms. Colin, help me on the last name. Haranchek, I was gonna get close, is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute for Higher Education and Educational Freedom. Prior to that, she was a senior policy analyst with the Commonwealth Foundation. Thank you both for joining us today. And why don't we just start on this side and go right across. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, for the opportunity to address you here today. It is uh, an honor to be in your presence. I'm Javier Martinez, and I serve as Speaker of the House for the New Mexico House of Representatives. I'm also the son of hardworking immigrant parents, and it is a testament to my parents, Javier and Ana, uh, and their belief in the American dream that I'm here today. I chose a life of public service because like all of you in this room, I too believe in the power of the American dream and I want all families and their children to achieve the same dreams that my parents were able to achieve. Allow me to paint a brief picture of child, early childhood in New Mexico for you. Every year we have roughly 22,000 children who are born in our state. Many, many of these children face enormous challenges from the onset. 80% of births in New Mexico every year are paid for by Medicaid dollars, so that tells you the level of poverty we're dealing with. And in addition to that, more than half of the births in New Mexico year to year, half of those are to a single parent household. In fact, more than 40 years ago in New Mexico, an average child had on average 11 adult meaningful relationships. Both parents, extended family, grandparents, a baseball coach, a priest in their life, Today, on average, less than two. That means not even both parents, generally speaking, are in the picture. When we talk about it taking a village to raise a child, in New Mexico, we are having to rebuild that village, and that is the work that we've undertaken over the last few years. However, I wanna be clear that as New Mexicans, we refuse to let these statistics define us and limit our vision for the future. In fact, quite the opposite. New Mexico is now investing in high quality, culturally and linguistically responsive, early childhood services, 
from prenatal all the way to the age of five. Following the Heckman equation from Nobel Prize winning economist, Dr. James Heckman, which finds a 13% return on investment for comprehensive high quality birth to five early education, New Mexico is betting on all of her children. Because of the boom years that New Mexico has experienced the last few years, we now have an unprecedented opportunity and a responsibility to put our values into action and build an early childhood system that can be a model for the rest of the country. For over a decade, as the chairman pointed out, a diverse coalition of community champions patiently and persistently built political will to do something big and bold and significant on early childhood in our state. And slowly but surely, we gain momentum. And that is thanks in no small part to leaders like you, Mr. Chairman, who was the first federal elected official to endorse our movement. Thanks to that movement, New Mexico is steadily rebuilding that village that it takes to raise a child. In 2019, we launched a cabinet level early childhood and care department so that there's now a dedicated group of professionals whose only job is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of every child during their most formative years. The research shows that the most uh, impactful time to invest in a child is between the ages of zero and three because that's when 80% of brain development takes place. In 2020, we established the Early Childhood Trust Fund which makes annual distributions of 5% for early childhood programs. And as the chairman mentioned in 2022, by a wide bipartisan margin, voters in New Mexico approved a landmark constitutional amendment which guarantees all children in the state the right to an early childhood education. This amendment also establishes a dedicated sustainable funding stream for early childhood education from our $25 billion land grant permanent fund. At the same time, we're also building up the infrastructure that's been, um, that, that has not been built over generations in New Mexico, and that includes building expanded childcare eligibility for parents and middle-class families. That includes tax reform, including passing a state-level child tax credit and a working family tax credit, which is one of the most generous in the country and piggybacks off of your federal earned income tax credit. In this last legislative session, we also reduce the tax burden on private childcare providers because in our system, it is important to keep that braided implementation system of public and private providers. New Mexico might be unique, but we know that many states face similar challenges to our state as well when it comes to early childhood. Federal ARPA funding was very helpful in helping us build up our system, but as that money runs out, states have to step up now and address the needs and the challenges in their communities. These investments, however, are worthwhile, both from a social perspective and from an economic perspective. My message to all lawmakers is to please be bold and persistent and to invest in your children. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Heinrich, Vice Chairman Swikart, and other distinguished members of the Joint Economic Committee. My name is Melissa Botech, and I'm the Vice President for Income Security and Child Care at the National Women's Law Center. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify before you today on the economic benefits of investing in child care and early education and on solutions to stabilize and rebuild this critical foundation of our economy. When you leave today's hearing, I want you to remember the story of Marlene Gallegos, a home-based child care provider in New Mexico and the mother of four children, two of whom have disabilities. 10 years ago, after struggling to find childcare for her own children, Merlene decided to dedicate herself to providing childcare for families like her own and is now a certified childcare and early education and special education teacher. Her workday starts at 5 a.m., teaching children through playing, singing, dancing, and reading, all while making observations and communicating with parents to facilitate each and every child's growth. Merlene loves her job, and she's worked hard to advance her education and to grow her business. And yet, she lives paycheck to paycheck in a system that chooses her to force between paying a living wage and raising fees on already struggling parents. But Merlene has turned that pain into purpose and is part of the successful movement in New Mexico that won and is now implementing a constitutional amendment that will result in higher salaries and better opportunities for all childcare professionals and more access to affordable childcare for parents. Marlene is one of hundreds of thousands of early educators who make work possible for the rest of us, prepare the next generation of children for success, and support widespread economic growth. The research is clear. 
When we invest in children starting at birth, it yields long-term positive health comes for their, outcomes for their health, education, and employment. When parents can find and afford childcare, more mothers are able to enter and stay in the workforce, resulting in higher earnings now and over the course of their lifetimes. And when workers have stable and affordable childcare, their employers have a more reliable and more productive workforce, and our economy experiences greater growth. However, despite this import, these important public benefits, childcare is too often perceived of and funded as though it were a private luxury. While free education for school-age children is a right, during the first five years of life, as the chairman noted, children's brains are growing their fastest, parents are largely left to figure it out on their own. And while the government is the primary financer of physical infrastructure, like roads and bridges, the cost of our nation's care infrastructure is primarily borne by women's unpaid and underpaid labor. It was no surprise then that this fragile sector went into free fall when the pandemic hit. By January of 2021, one in six childcare jobs had been lost and millions of women had been pushed out of the labor market. Lawmakers took action with the American Rescue Plan, which helped 220,000 childcare programs stay open and help reverse the rapid decline in women's labor force participation. Unfortunately, the long-term funding to create a sustainable childcare system was not included in the Inflation Reduction Act, creating two dramatic funding cliffs, one this past September of 2023 and the second arriving in September of 2024. These cliffs are wreaking havoc on the nation's families and providers. According to a February 2024 survey from the National Association for the Education of Young Children, nearly half of responding providers indicated they'd had to increase their program's tuition in the last six months. Many providers have left the field for jobs in retail, restaurants, or other low-paid sectors, exacerbating the childcare supply crisis and leaving parents with few or no choices when it comes to finding childcare. We know what works. The impact of public funding is evident in the success of the federal relief funds and in the progress that blue and red states alike have seen where they've invested their own dollars. But state investments can't make up for the federal funding cliff. The $1 billion increase in child care and Head Start in the recently passed fiscal year 2024 appropriations bill was an important down payment. But with another funding cliff looming in September of 2024, Congress must act swiftly on the Biden administration's supplemental request for $16 billion to continue to stabilize the child care sector. While this increased emergency funding is crucial, the goal is not just to return to an inequitable pre-COVID-19 status quo. Sustained and robust funding that guarantees access to affordable, high-quality child care and early learning ensures a living wage for early educators and builds the supply is the only sustainable solution for our nation's child care crisis. For those who argue that we can't afford to make these investments, President Biden's budget shows that there would be more than enough revenue to support child care for all families if the wealthiest individuals and big corporations paid their fair share of taxes. Our child care crisis is a policy choice. We know what works and now we need the political will to act upon it. Merlene's advice to us is to never give up. Please keep her and millions of families who rely on early educators like her in mind as you make critical decisions on investing in child care and early learning. Dr. Burke. Good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Burke. I'm the director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are mine and are not to be construed as the official position of the Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Chairman Heinrich and Vice Chairman Schweikert for inviting me to testify today. Proponents of universal preschool tend to appeal to just two studies to make their case, the Abyssidarian Preschool Study and the Perry Preschool Project, both of which found positive benefits for participants. But why do proponents continue to appeal to two studies that are 60 and nearly 70 years old, respectively? Because the results have never been replicated in other studies. The Abyssidarian and Perry studies include just 57 and 58 children, respectively, in the treatment groups, and both suffered from methodological limitations weakening their external validity. What about current early education programs like Head Start? When Head Start launched in 1965, proponents were clear that its sole purpose, quote, is to prepare children for elementary school. It was designed as a preschool program. Today, annual Head Start expenditures total $12.2 billion, equating to more than $12,000 per child. Unfortunately, this great society relic has been failing children for decades. 
On a quiet Friday before Christmas in 2012, when most of the federal government had already headed home for Christmas and left Washington, Health and Human Services, which administers Head Start, finally released a highly anticipated and four years old overdue but scientifically rigorous evaluation of the program. As the Heritage Foundation's Jay Green wrote at the time, quote, HHS might as well have put the results on display in a locked filing cabinet in a disused lavatory behind a sign that says, beware of the leopard. It's no wonder. The rigorous evaluation, which tracked 5,000 three and four-year-old children through the end of third grade, found that Head Start had little to no impact on their parents' parenting practices, their social emotional well-being, or their cognitive outcomes, or their access to health healthcare outcomes, to healthcare. So what about at the state level? Tennessee's voluntary pre-K program is considered a gold standard preschool program. Here again, a randomized control trial evaluation conducted by scholars at Vanderbilt University found the control and experiment groups, quote, began to diverge with the Tennessee preschool children scoring lower than the control children on most of the measures. The differences were significant on both achievement composite measures and on math scores. These findings are consistent in the preschool literature. Although participants may experience some benefit upon program entry, those programs fade by first grade and evaporate by third grade. In addition to the academic shortcomings, more than half, 56% of women with children, would prefer to stay at home and care for their family, according to Gallup. A plurality of Americans, 44%, say it is ideal for one parent to stay at home when their children are young, and another 36% say one parent should stay at home at least part-time, according to Pew. Pew also found in a prior survey that among women with children under 18, a full 67% would prefer just part-time work or full-time homemaking. Among married mothers, that rises to 76%. Just 23% of married mothers list working full-time as their ideal scenario. Even then, Full-time center-based care comes in last among families' preferred arrangements, with just 11% of working mothers saying the use of center-based care was best for young children. Yet, the push for universal preschool and daycare taxes those same mothers to pay for an arrangement counter to their preferences, reducing the money they have to spend on their own children. There is nothing more important for the future of America than strong families. So how can policymakers support families in accessing the types of early education and care that they want without preferencing one form of care over another? In addition to letting families keep more of their own money, Congress should build off the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which expanded 529 savings accounts from the college level down to K-12 and allow those accounts to be used for preschool and early education and care expenses. Congress should also allow eligible families to take their Head Start dollars to private providers of choice, providing them with more flexibility and remove unnecessary regulations from a, making a market in DC an actual thriving market that is affordable for families, something that state legislature, legislature should also mimic. Thank you. Ms. Say it again. Horancheck. Horancheck. Welcome. Chairman Heinrich, Vice Chairman Swikert, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. As already mentioned, my name is Colleen Horancheck, and I am a policy analyst at the Cato Institute's Center for Educational Freedom. The views I express in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Cato Institute. I'll make three main points today. First, the rhetoric does not match reality when it comes to early childhood education. Second, one size does not fit all. Preschoolers and their parents are too diverse for a federal government program to make sense. And third, the Department of Education's disastrous rollout of the revised Free Application for Federal Student Aid, better known as FAFSA, shows why the federal government should stay away from early childhood education. Rhetoric versus reality, or something is not better than nothing. Every few years, there's a push in Washington, D.C. for universal or nearly universal preschool. Proponents claim a whole host of benefits, from improved reading ability to fewer dropouts and teen pregnancies to future, increased future income. In 2021, President Biden 
touted such vast benefits from his universal preschool plan that factcheck.org took him to task, noting, quote, there's plenty of research on specific targeted programs, but there isn't much on universal programs. And the research that does exist in many cases is more nuanced and less optimistic than Biden suggests, end quote. There's no consistent evidence that large-scale preschool programs are beneficial, and some are even harmful. In January 2022, researchers from Vanderbilt University released a study of Tennessee's Voluntary Pre-K Initiative, which Dr. Burke just mentioned, and it found that children who participated in the program experienced significant negative effects compared to children who did not. Harms included worse academic program performance, higher likelihood to have discipline issues and be referred for special education. Dale Farron, one of the lead researchers, concluded that at least for poor children, quote, it turns out something is not better than nothing, end quote. There are several possible reasons for this, but one prominent one seems to be that preschoolers learn best when they have time to play independently. However, large scale programs tend toward whole group instruction, rigid behavioral rules, and very little time outside and in free play. Next, one size does not fit all. The wants and needs of preschoolers and their parents are too diverse for a federal program to make sense. I have four children, I saw this firsthand with my own kids, that they had different needs, each one. My oldest daughter was very shy, so my main goal with preschool for her was to get her comfortable with teachers and other children. I chose a preschool that emphasized play and had a warm, nurturing environment. My second born was not shy. He was doing first grade math, always trying to keep up with his sister. He was doing first grade math and reading small chapter books when he was four. For him, the challenge of a more academic preschool made sense. If my own family has diverse needs, it's not surprising that a December 2020 poll from the Bipartisan Policy Center found parents have a wide variety of preferences when it comes to child care and preschool, with a somewhat even split among various models. A federal program would likely include mandates that would make it very hard for religious and home-based providers to participate. And minimum hour requirements would prevent part-time programs from participating at all. As you've probably seen, the nation is undergoing a transformation in K-12 education with more and more states taking a student-centered approach instead of the one-size-fits-all model. It would be a terrible irony if preschool education went in the other direction, towards a more institutionalized system at the same time K-12 education is becoming more, liberal, more liberalized. And finally, the FAFSA debacle should put talk of a federal preschool program to bed. My youngest daughter is headed to Catholic University of America here in DC for nursing school in the fall. At least we think she is. We still haven't found out what her expected cost of attendance will be because the federal government has taken such a massive role in college financing. Now most schools use FAFSA even for private awards. And the Department of Education's attempt to revise the FAFSA program has been an unmitigated disaster and caused significant delays. I believe the Secretary of Education was here today testifying about that. Um, this is putting the squeeze on colleges, students, and families, and especially lower income families. There's a saying that the bigger you are, the harder you fall. When the federal government gets involved, any failures or problems will have widespread impacts. I don't know how anyone witnessing the FAFSA mess could think, let's get the government more involved in early childhood education. The bottom line is America is too large and diverse for a federal preschool program to make sense. This is one reason the Constitution gives Congress no authority over education. Sound bites about large-scale preschool programs make the idea seem attractive, but it's important to look closer and recognize the harms that a federal preschool plan would have on families and providers. The rules and restrictions that would be part of a federal preschool program would likely force many preferred models out of business. We tried the bureaucratic top-down approach in K-12 education, and parents are clamoring for more options. There's no reason to think that more mandates and fewer options would help um, improve opportunities for children. Thank you. Um. Vice Chairman Schweikert has to go in a few minutes, so I'm going to uh, let him start the first round of questions, and then we'll alternate. Thank you, Chairman. And it's always dangerous. I'm going to leave you all on your own. And um, that Senator Peter is, is my friend, and he remembers when we adopted our first little girl. And I was showing him pictures of the sibling that we've now adopted. Um, I like this issue, and which is sort of hear, weird to hear from a Republican, but I'm I often think we may have been caught in some of our dogma. Um, and in least listening to the speaker, um, you, you almost wonder, saying, OK, he, his state has some very tough statistics. Um, 
is a time to think differently, is a time to think of a much more holistic solution. Um, and forgive my um, sort of fact checking, it's a little compulsive. So today we have what, about uh, the latest data was 12,700 more childcare workers today than we did in pre-pandemic. So that's not a lot of growth. It's one, two percent growth, but at the same time, actually, the number of children has actually, as you know, how many of us have school districts that are actually closing schools because there's fewer children. So Dr. Burke, I'm gonna give you something that's brutally uncomfortable. So I came to you and said, today you have a clean slate. You have a state where, you know, the, the, the kids, let's be honest, have some, have some tough issues. If I gave you, said, you get to create a holistic approach, what would be good for Arizona? What would be good for the, the entire country? What would be good for New Mexico? What would it look like? What, what actually is the right approach as an economist yeah. to approach this? Well, a couple of things. First, and to Colleen's point a, a second ago, there are issues that um, are really endemic among the K-12 sector that should be addressed as well. And so that needs to be a part of the conversation. New Mexico is a state that lacks any education choice options for families. And so at the K-12 level, I would certainly start there. When it comes to the pre-K and early childhood education level, I think a few of the recommendations that I mentioned earlier would go a long way to helping New Mexico families, expanding that 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act so that it makes 529 accounts eligible for pre-K and childcare expenses would go a long way. Uh, many of the families in New Mexico are eligible for Head Start, relegating those families to a distant federal program that has completely failed them academically, that the GAO has found is replete with fraud, that has many other issues that have made it an unworkable program. Relegating those families to that distant federal program, we could do much better for them if the federal government is to continue funding a program like Head Start, at least allow those families to access their share of that $12,000 and take it to a provider of choice. Okay, now so the second half of that type of question is, tell me a state that's doing it where it may not be perfect, but you're seeing positive yeah. outcomes. Well, if you're gonna do a state level pre-K program or early childhood education and care program, which even then we have to be extremely careful to not preference center-based care over family-based care. But if you're gonna do it, going the direction of a state like Florida is a better direction to go where they have a publicly financed uh, pre-K system, but you can choose a private provider of choice in Florida. Uh, Florida has adopted that choice model throughout its system, pre-K, all the way through its, its K-12 system. So if you're going to do it, that's the way to do it. And it's open to both of you, but um, how about a state like Arizona, where we actually have a very vigorous choice system? I mean, my child, um, my little girl is in a school called Basis. It's, I had no idea second graders had two hours of homework every night, <laughs> um, but sh it's working. Um, I mean, you know, yeah. where's the robustness? Where's actually the joy and the kindness to the next generation in building the skill sets? Um, well, if I could just say quickly on Arizona, because Arizona is rightly held up as a model of choice in the K-12 realm. So Arizona has the most robust education choice market in the country. Uh, the reason why it has been so successful is something that it should think about applying to its pre-K sector, which is it has an extremely light touch when it comes to its regulatory environment. If we look across the country, the number of uh, family-based in-home providers, preschool providers, has been cut in half since 2005. And a big part of that is because of the over-regulatory uh, nature of um, oversight that we've seen in the states when it comes to preschool. So a lesson that we can take from Arizona is in its K-12 sector. Make sure that regulations are as light as possible, that they're actually providing oversight and accountability to families, but don't over-regulate the private market. Don't make it harder for a private provider or an in-home provider to operate. We want light regulations so that families have as many choices as possible in the pre-K space. All right, and Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate your kindness letting me go first. We have an issue to deal with in the House. Can you imagine that? Um, I, yeah, but um, I, I want us to be intellectually robust here. This is one of the subjects where we get, we go back to our campaign talking points.
And I think the moral thing for my kids, for everyone's kids, your grandkids, is let's get our data, let's get the facts straight and figure out how we make this next generation more prosperous, because heaven knows we're going to need it. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, we will uh, go through the rest of the questions in the order that folks arrived. And I'm going to start with you, Speaker Martinez. Um, as we talk about potential federal legislation that can support families with young children, what lessons do you want my colleagues to take back to their districts and their states uh, from what you've experienced so far? And how have the states, I, I know it's it's a new program and it's it's being built as we speak, but investments have been made. Have they started to move the needle on affordability and access? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee uh, for that question, very important question. I, I wanna make sure we distinguish between uh, the idea of building out only a pre-K program mm -hmm. versus a comprehensive early childhood education program. And let me explain if I may, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. A comprehensive, robust early childhood education program and system will include everything from home visitation services for, from prenatal to at least three years of age. Think of it as coaching, life skills, parenting skills, um, and also combined with a robust child care system. And on top of that, pre-K for those that are age eligible, usually three to four years old. Um, if you focus on just one of those pieces, you will not get the results. Or if you get some results, they'll be they'll vary from place to place, and and the reality is that they'll be uh, not as robust as we would like. And and you know I I'm a big believer that if we just do pre-K and nothing else, we're not going to move the needle very far. Uh, if if you'd allow me, um, Mr. Chair, um, the the New Mexico's largest provider of home visitation programs is a private program, private nonprofit uh, tied to a religious institution, CHI St. Joseph's Children. Uh, they serve about 1,000 kids every year uh, between prenatal and three. It's a three-year program. Uh, they started a longitudinal study uh, a few years back, and some of the preliminary data is incredible. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some of this up to you. Uh, this is a study done by uh, the University of New Mexico. Uh, they chose 400 participants, 200 with home visiting services and 200 without. Uh, randomized study, both groups with identical demographics. Children are now anywhere between three and six years old. Here are some of the preliminary findings. The service group had no need for neonatal intensive care, no need for visits to the emergency room in the first year of life. Problem solving uh, skill sets for the children in the service group, 28% higher than those who were not, 21% greater vocabulary, 14% higher fine motor function, and parents have had zero encounters with the criminal justice system. That's what we're seeing in New Mexico in one home visitation program. So as, as, as you all consider building out uh, these, these early care programs, Keep in mind that it's not just one piece, but rather it needs to be the entire continuum. Furthermore, in New Mexico, we have choice. We have choice in K-12. We have a robust charter school system. In fact, my children attend a Montessori charter school because that's what works for them. But we've got other amazing schools. We've got the Native American Community Academy, which is teaching young indigenous children in their home language, in their cultural skill sets and assets. Um, and we also have choice in our early ed system. Uh, our parents, our families can take their subsidy and go to a home-based provider, which may have no more than six kids, and it's a grandmother cooking for the kids and teaching the kids life skills and academic skills, or they can take their child into a center-based uh, program if they so choose to. Um, so I think that keeping in mind how important it is to focus on the entire continuum is what's really gonna help us move the needle, and that's what we're seeing in New Mexico now as well. When, uh, when my oldest son was an infant and then a toddler, um, I was a consultant and later a city counselor. Uh, and I was able to care for him myself while his mother worked during the day. She would come home in the late afternoon. We would switch roles. And we embraced this challenging, but I think very successful arrangement out of choice. Um, 
certainly many parents simply don't have that kind of privilege. Uh, Ms. Botea, what, what are the impacts of the current limits in choice that many people have based on their geography or, or their income uh, on the economy as a whole, on labor force participation, on economic productivity, and then obviously on the, uh, the family involved? Right. Some people argue that uh, we can't afford to invest in childcare and early learning, but we would argue that you, we can't afford not to invest uh, because it is not just important for families' individual economic security, especially with two-thirds of families relying on a mother's income, uh, but it also helps the economy overall. Uh, recent studies showed that the lack of childcare and early education is costing our economy about $122 billion. This is a post-pandemic update. Um, and that is in lost economic productivity and lost tax revenue from people getting pushed out of the labor force. So this is an issue not just for sort of the individual family unit, but for the health of the economy overall. Um, from a small business perspective, there was just a hearing earlier this week uh, where new polling from uh, over 500 small businesses showed that nearly six in 10 are saying it's harder to start and maintain a small business when their employees are experiencing such great childcare challenges. Yeah. And so the really the, the lack of investment is having ripple effects. But we also know the inverse is true. That when we proactively invest in children, um, and particularly from birth to five, we see long-term um, positive consequences of that. Uh, that's not just, again, for the economy overall, but for individual families. We did a study at National Women's Law Center with Columbia University, and we showed that if you made high-quality, affordable childcare available for, for all, you would see a 17% increase in mother's labor force participation, resulting in over $100,000 in lifetime earnings and retirement security growth. And when you think about the pay gap, when you think about uh, widening economic inequality, and you think about uh, the fact, again, that two-thirds of families are relying on that mother's income, uh, being able to actually enter, stay, and grow in the labor force is a critical component to their family's economic security. Thank you. Um, Congressman Beyer. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, thank all of you for coming and, and for your, your written and your oral testimonies. Um, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee in the House, where we have been huge fans of the child tax credit. Um, it was passed in a very bipartisan way during the pandemic. And we just <clears> passed <throat> uh, a bipartisan child tax credit bill, which is stuck in the Senate at the moment, um, which we hope to get done before the end of the year. Uh, Speaker Martinez, you know, I know New Mexico Working Families Tax Credit has been part of that and is still in place. The Children's Hospital of Philadelphia recently had a study that showed that financial assistance like the child tax credit could eliminate rates of child abuse and neglect. And that obviously alleviating economic stress in family could tangibly improve child safety and lists economic stress as a risk factor for abuse and neglect in a family. Can you talk about how your New Mexico child tax credit has been this seems to be working for you guys. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and um, uh, Representative Beyer. Uh, great question. New Mexico um, has had a longstanding working families tax credit, which piggybacks off the earned income tax credit. Um, for about 10, 12 years, it was 10% of a federal credit. Um, in 2019, the New Mexico legislature, um, under the leadership of, of former chairman of tax, uh, Jim Trujillo, who, who recently passed away, a, a giant among New Mexico uh, politics, um, he led the effort to increase that, uh, that working families tax credit from 10% uh, all the way up to 25%. Uh, that working families tax credit is also inclusive of um, children aging out of the foster care system who may not have children themselves so they can claim themselves for a few years um, um, post uh, foster program. Um, and it is also inclusive of undocumented workers who file taxes. Uh, New Mexico being a border state um, has a uh, relatively to our population, a relatively large community of undocumented workers who are working out in the fields, uh, working in agriculture, working in the oil and gas industry and who are raising families. And we felt that it was only right to be inclusive of those families as well uh, with, our, with our working families tax credit. Uh, with regard to the impacts, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the, the data you cite from, um, um, uh, from your source, I think is also correct. Uh, those tax credits are putting money directly back in the pockets of working families. 
Um, it is my belief, and I think the belief of many researchers uh, who I co collaborate with, that this is probably one of the most um, impactful poverty alleviation programs in the country. And let's not forget who started it. It was President Gerald Ford who, who led the way all those many years ago. Uh, so it's something that we're very proud of. We're proud to be one of the most generous in the country and also one of the most inclusive in the country. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Burke, I, I generally I find it difficult to agree with most of what Heritage recommends, but I always read you guys carefully. And it was, I learned a lot of things reading your testimony. Um, one quick thing, 30 years ago I chaired a commission for two and a half years on child sexual assault in Virginia. And one of the conclusions was we need to do criminal background checks on those who work with small children. Uh, it was stunning to find 350 convicted predators um, working in child care things. So when we move to light regulation, let's not get rid of the criminal background checks. I agree on that. <laughs> okay. um, when, when you look, I think you make a really strong case though when you say Oh, the, the Head Start, the advantages are gone by second or third grade, some of these other studies. Um, it seems to me, on the one hand, that argues that when you're a child living in poverty with no books in the home, undereducated parents, that you can't just educate them for two or three years and then give up, that they're going to need that extra help through most of their lives. Um, how do you respond to that? that? Is it really a waste that we made that investment in them when they were three, four, and five years old, just because it didn't persist when they went back to the the crappy school system. Well, so the thing to, to think about with the Head Start study is it is a randomized control trial evaluation. So two groups of children who are eligible for services applied, were able to access services if they wanted to, but then either didn't access the Head Start program for whatever reason didn't enroll. And so we know on the front end that we control for any of these background variables that might have influenced the outcomes that we see in the data. And so I say that because we know that, in fact, to your point, there was no difference at the end of the day between the kids, the same kids in poverty, single parent home, whatever it might be, lack of books in the home. There was no difference for those children having gone through the Head Start program and not having gone through the Head Start program. And again, this is an RCT, a rigorous evaluation done by HHS itself. And so, you know, the custodial care question, and, and this is something that um, was brought up earlier is a separate question from the academic effects of something like preschool. I mentioned earlier that when Lyndon Johnson launched the pre-K program, the Head Start program in 65, that proponents were very clear that they saw it as a preschool program. Even if we set aside the fact that we aren't seeing robust academic effects as a result of Head Start, one still might make the case that the function of custodial care is an important function. And so again, I would say if, and it's a big if, the federal government is going to continue to fund Head Start, at least give these families some choices to find options that work better for them. The current spending on Head Start at $12,000 is more than the average price of daycare in 37 states. So giving families that money directly, if you're gonna to continue to fund it, would most likely in most states be more than enough for them to access something that works better for them than the federal Head Start program. Thank I yield back, Mr. Chair. Senator Vance. You want me to go to yeah. Congresswoman Porter? We'll come back to you. So I have an investment opportunity um, for everyone in the hearing room today. For every dollar that you invest, you will get back at least four dollars. Anyone want to invest? I'll take it. It's pretty good. You won't lose your money. You'll always get back more than you put in. And unlike some of these investment schemes, mine is legal. Anyone in? This is uh, just math. Four is more than one. More money is better than less money. Economists agree. Republicans, Democrats agree. This investment is not a hard decision. People would snap this up in the real world. Invest a dollar, get four back, no risk. Ms. Botaic, would you believe me if I told you that Congress had that same investment opportunity for our country and turned it down every year? Sadly, yes. <laughs> Why would you believe that? Because we know that the science is there, that when we support children and families, uh, especially starting at birth, that it yields long-term and outsized benefits for families and for our economy. And yet, here we are over 50 years after Nixon vetoed universal child care, still with families struggling uh, to find and afford care and providers making poverty wages. And I think you gave earlier, what is the total new estimate of how much this would generate for our, if we had 
affordable childcare, full access to childcare. What would this generate for our economy? So for a family? For the uh, whole economy. For the whole economy. Okay, so we're losing right now $122 billion. $122 billion that we could have in our economy, and yet what we hear around here all the time is that we don't have money to do things. So Congress has had years to invest in universal child care. Every dollar we put in would have generated estimates show about $4 for our economy, um, yet we still don't have it. Why, Ms. Potato, why don't we have this? Well, we need to build the political and public will. Um, the voters are there. Okay, so let's do that. the problem must be then the will of the people here. Because yeah. voters support this. So let's talk about who's here. How would you describe the gender balance and average age of Congress? It skews older, male, and whiter. That's correct. So about only about 28% of members of Congress are women. The median age in the Senate is 65, and the median age in the House is 58. Um, so lots, on average, lots of older people, lots of older men, lots of men. Is this the type of group who personally needs early childhood education? Generally not. Generally not. So early childhood education won't benefit many members, most, the average, member of Congress. Most members' kids are grown, so they don't have to care about where their kids are going. And even when their kids were young, most members leaned heavily on their wives, and I say wives because most members are men, um, heterosexual men, um, to juggle their kids' schedule. And frankly, there's a lot of rich people in Congress who didn't have to worry about how to afford childcare or how to navigate the system because they were wealthy. Too many in Congress don't get it because they never had to live it. So this leads to the familiar policy pattern. The older men collectively, that's our Congress, not to take away from any individual champions, including Representative Beyer and Senator Heinrich, but the collective body of older, richer men in Congress overinvest in things they understand, like the Pentagon, and they underinvest in things like early childhood education that don't personally benefit them, maybe don't even make sense to them, and maybe do not reflect how they lived their lives, even if they are big problems for the majority of Americans. So, um, Ms. Boteak, when institutions like Congress perpetuate long-standing social disparities for women like this, is there a term for that? I think it's called patriarchy. Patriarchy <laughs> is correct. I would also call it structural sexism. When we say smash the patriarchy, when we say that structural sexism continues to permeate this body and this policy, our policies, that's what we're talking about. We're not imagining it. It's not about interpersonal slights. It is about what this body chooses to get done and to fund and to focus on and what always ends up on the cutting room floor in legislation. Sexual, structural sexism is an age-old story. It's not going to go away by itself. It's going to go away because we make it go away. When we stop undervaluing the work of black and brown women, who might, or the majority of childcare workers, when we start recognizing that women can and must contribute to our economy if we're going to have a globally competitive economy. So, um, Ms. Botek, to fix this problem, Congress has to abandon these sexist, outdated, ideas and start thinking more about investments. How much would Congress need to invest to establish universal early childhood education? We have been advocating for uh, $700 billion over uh, 10 years to invest in high quality early uh, care and education, uh, which could easily be supported by uh, taxing wealthy individuals and corporations. So you're advocating for $700 billion over 10 years. Mm -hmm. President Biden, I remember everyone proposed $400 billion for preschool and child care, mm -hmm. and yet that would have multiplied by four, generated trillions of dollars for our economy. So all of our witnesses, everybody said that we'd take this bet, we'd quadruple our money if we could. So investing in early childhood education shouldn't be a hard call, even given the profile of Congress. We should all want to make investments that pay back. So if my colleagues are not moved by the clear economic benefit of investing in early childhood education, maybe they'll be moved simply by this single mom asking them to care on behalf of all the other parents of young children who are struggling in this country. Either I implore Congress to invest in childcare, childcare workers, and early childhood education, and I yield back. Senator Vance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, Dr. Burke, I want to direct my questions <clears throat> in, in your direction, and in particular, uh, 
one of the things that I worry about in the child care conversation is that uh, there is a pretty rigid class divide between how professionally educated people see child care options and preferences and family formation and how uh, working class Americans see family options and, uh, and, and child care preferences. And I, I want to just sort of start, do you think it's an accurate characterization to say that those with professional degrees are much, much more biased towards those uh, family care models that depend on two earners at home and outsourcing child care, whereas working class Americans have a much stronger preference for at least part of the time one of the parents or some other relative being able to care for the child at home. Is that an accurate characterization of public opinion? I think that's generally the case. So just picking up on something uh, Congresswoman Porter said earlier, um, you know, th there, there certainly obviously are all manner of ways in which Congress is not reflective of the American people as a whole. But of course, one of the ways in which Congress is not reflective of the American people a, 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 a whole, as a whole uh, is that we have a much different education and income skew than the country at large. And I, I, I guess one thing uh, I, I'm sort of wondering is, it, has anybody talked about, you know, if, just, just take the Head Start program, okay? We're obviously spend close to a trillion dollars in this country on early childhood care. We have a lot of my colleagues, especially on my side of the aisle, tend to support what's called school choice, where you give families different options. And, and I wonder if there have been any significant proposals in your mind, any credible proposals in your mind that would actually extend the, ch the choice model a little bit more broadly. And so, you know, say for example, you're a professionally educated or working class person, and you would like to have everybody, every adult in the household working outside the home, and you would like to have childcare paid for by people outside the home. That's one model. But another model is, and I, in fact, I think the preference of most Americans actually fits in with this model, is uh, if you're a mom or a dad, maybe you spend a few years at least working part-time, so you spend more time at home with the kids, and then you re-enter the market workforce at some point later. And obviously that was more true of women 50 years ago. It's increasingly true of men and women today. But I'm sort of curious, have, have you thought of any school choice-like proposals that would not foist the professional class preference on everybody, but would actually give people some choices for how they care for their children during those formative years? Well, thank you for those questions. And if I could just, for the record, say I would not take Congresswoman Porter's uh, investment opportunity because it's investing with other people's money and it's making choices that they might not themselves want to make with those dollars. That's what Congress does. So on the, the questions that you um, mentioned, Senator Vance, so as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority, three quarters, 76% of married women, married mothers, would prefer either to work part-time or to be full-time homemakers. And so you're absolutely right that there is a preference among the majority of, work, of uh, married mothers in this country to at least have some part-time opportunities rather than going full-time into the workforce and relying on uh, outsourced or paid for childcare, just 23% of uh, married mothers would prefer to work full-time when their children are young. So when we put the thumb on the scale of large federal or state uh, spending on these pre-K programs, we're putting our thumb on the scale of more people going full-time into the workforce, which might be against their preferences, more people utilizing center-based care, which might be contrary to their preferences. On the choice question, it's a great one. There's a, a great uh, proposal that has excellent policies for reforming Head Start that Senator Mike Lee has championed over the years. It's the Head Start Reform Act. And the policies in that proposal would take existing federal Head Start dollars and allow eligible families to use those at any provider of choice rather than relegating them to ineffective and quite frankly fraudulent and in some cases unsafe Head Start centers. So giving some choice options within Head Start and again, moving forward with the, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act reform, which took 529s from just the college savings component down to K-12, continuing to expand that down to the pre-K and early ed level would provide some choice options and enable families. You could imagine a situation where you find out you're expecting, uh, your wife's expecting, you tell everybody in your family, contribute to my 529 day one, and you're then able to build a pretty decent nest egg by the time you, you know, are eligible for preschool to actually pay for that out of pocket. So there are some choice mechanisms out there that make sense. 
Uh, thank, thank you for that answer. I'm mindful of time, so I'll just be brief. But it, it just it occurs to me that there's something a little deranged about the conversation when we have, to your point, 76% of married moms, and I'm sure a lot of single moms and a lot of dads too, who would like to spend more time at home with their children during those formative years. And our answer to them is, you've got to go to the workforce because that's what's going to raise GDP. Correct. It's like, what is wrong if that's the heuristic we apply to these decisions in public policy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to uh, do another quick round, and I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes, so I will hand the, the gavel off to uh, uh, Representative Beyer. But I, I'm curious, uh, you know, we've heard a little bit about the, the structure of the 529 account as an early childhood solution. And I want to ask you, Speaker Martinez, I, and first I should say I like 529s. I think they're a good, um, th they are helpful to me today for you know my kids' college education. Um, but when you match up 529s, and I generally uh, support expanding them to additional educational structures, whether that's trade school or early childhood, um, but you know the reality of most New Mexicans. And uh, most of your constituents, most of my constituents, when they're freshmen, uh, college age children start university, um, they don't have a 529 of any substantial means. Just talk a little bit about the, the scale of what you're trying to do in New Mexico and whether or not that would how that would fit into a, uh, a broader approach, including choices which you've articulated. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, I think in a perfect world, we would all have access to 529 accounts. We would all fund them. We would all invest them. And our children, when they turned 18 and go to college, could cash them out. That's not the reality for our state. That's not the reality for most of the country. Uh, you know, the notion that working families, one of them, one of the parents wants to stay home and be with the child, I, I support that. Problem is they can't afford it. The federal minimum wage is what, $7 and change? How can you afford to stay home with your newborn? This is not about forcing people into the workforce for the purposes of GDP, increased GDP. This is about families and being able to raise and nurture our children. So if that's the route we wanna take, then let's talk about a guaranteed basic income program and allow new moms or new dads to stay at home for three months, for six months, for whatever length of time they want to stay at home so that they can be with their child. Um, in terms of, going back to your question, look, um, in an early childhood delivery system, the notion of 529 accounts just doesn't compute with me. Um, you need to be able to get your child sometimes within weeks of them being born into a program. Um, I believe that uh, what we're building in New Mexico, which is, as you know, a blended system of delivery between private and public providers is the way to go. 529 accounts for college for higher ed, that's fine. Um, I've got another one for you all. It's actually a Senate bill that Senator uh, Cory Booker is running, and I believe, Mr. Chairman, you might be on that bill as well, and that's a baby bonds bill. Mm -hmm. Let's build trust fund accounts for every baby born in this country, or at least every baby that needs it, every baby from a working family to make sure that that child, once they turn 18, has a 40, 50, $60,000 trust account that they can use for higher ed, that they can use to start a business, that they can use to buy their first house. Ms. Botaic, uh, in your testimony, you talk about how this private market for childcare and pre-K is, is sort of fundamentally broken. Um, as it leaves families with high costs and it really leaves providers in many, many cases, if not with lo very low pay. Talk a little bit about what is needed in this sector to solve for both of those things, to make sure that um, we're making compensating providers fairly uh, and adequately and also taking care of the parents who are shaping the next generation. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, you know, when you have a broken market, you need a third party investor. And given the public benefits of childcare and early learning for children, for families, for the economy overall, uh, childcare is a public good um, and should be invested in as such with sustained and robust funding. Um, and that injection of funding 
would allow for a building of a supply. Because one of the things we haven't really talked about today is you can give families money for childcare, but they have to be able to find it. Mm -hmm. And if there is not a workforce of well-paid professional childcare providers, uh, whether they're home-based, school-based, center-based, friend, family, and neighbors, um, if we are not making that a job with living wage, we're not going to have child care there for people to use. And so one of the things I think is important is, yes, we need to make child care more affordable, um, but we also need to make sure that the workforce, um, who is over 90% women and disproportionately black, brown, and immigrant women, are paid a living wage for the essential work that they do. Um, I'll also say that, you know, the we're talking a lot about universal, but universal doesn't mean... Uh, the same for everybody. We've always been really clear that a mixed delivery system is ultimately what is needed um, for birth to five. And that means that families should be able to choose if they want a home-based provider, if they want a center-based provider, if they want to use friend, family, and neighbor care. Um, but right now, families have no choice. Um, okay. And that's, I think, a really important thing that we're that also oftentimes lawmakers miss is that when we don't invest in the system, families don't actually have a choice. They're faced with just impossible choices. Do I leave the job when I need the, the money to make this month's rent? Um, or do I um, stay and um, you know, sort of try and find childcare that is I can't afford and that it's eating up over half of my paycheck? That's not a choice. Uh, and so if we actually want thriving families, thriving caregivers, um, sustained and robust investment is is required. Thank you. I'm going to hand the gavel over to the very capable Congressman Beyer, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. I don't think there is a more important issue uh, than how we can elevate our entire country by better educating our, um, our, our pre-K population, and I really appreciate all of you contributing to this conversation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman Heinrich, very much, and good luck this afternoon. Um, we won't keep you much longer, but it's a fascinating conversation. Um, Ms. Boteak, how do we make it more affordable? So, um, there, if you put uh, sustained and robust funding into the system, and there's a variety of different ways that you can do that, um, but primarily right now, the main program is the Child Care Development Block Grant. Um, they're in Build Back Better. There was a proposal for, um, you know, a child care guarantee for states, et cetera. But the idea being that you give parents opportunities through these vouchers to be able to find a child care that meets the needs and the standards and that fits their family's needs. And at the same time, you have... Uh, standards about how much early educators are making, uh, making sure that it's a, a field that is paid like the professionals that they are with living wages, and you invest in supply building. Um, because again, most of the uh, cost of providing early care and education is labor costs. Uh, because in order to have high quality environments for children and families, there need to be appropriate ratios of caregivers to children. Um, and so that's that's the way forward is I wish, you know, actually I don't wish, I'm glad that it's not overly complicated. When you have, again, parents paying too much and when you have providers earning too little, sustained and robust funding is the number one policy intervention. And then you can play with the details. But without that money, there's no choice. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, my public funding is really a precursor to a lot of the large and structural changes that we need to make in our system. I'll also say that Early childhood education is part of a larger suite of families that we can have to invest in family, uh, policies that we can have to invest in families, paid family and medical leave, a fully refundable and periodic payment child tax credit, WIC. These basic necessities are all part of the suite of programs to help children and their families thrive. Um, and also, again, provide that choice if parents choose how much to work part-time, full-time, et cetera. Things like paid leave, things like the child tax credit, there are a range of policies that support choice for parents. But if we don't invest in childcare and early learning, one of those choices is taken away. Yeah, you, you said something about different needs for different children. I know it showed up in Ms. Haranchik's testimony too, different kids. I have four children. Um, I just realized they had four different preschool experiences mm -hmm. um, based on who they were and, and where they went. Um, and Dr. Burke, you talked about the, the, the Head Start kids taking the $12,000 and going and finding their best things. It, but also paired with the 76% of moms part-time or, or full-time. I know my mother stayed home full-time with the six children, no choice. 
Um, my wife much preferred to freelance where she could, but was home a lot. But wouldn't, if we're willing to give them $12,000, wouldn't we also be willing to do robust child tax credits? Because when we had those, I know this from my daughter and my two grandchildren, it made it a lot easier on that family to be able to afford things. Thank you for that question. So on the, the Head Start question on Head Start spending, we should not, as a matter of course, at the federal level fund daycare and preschool. It is simply not the role of the federal government to do any of this. And so, hence I always have the caveat at the beginning, if the federal government is going to continue to fund Head Start, we should at least voucherize it, make it work more like the Child Care and Development Block Grant, half of which is voucherized to provide these families with more options. In terms of how we might drive down costs, I think one of the best things we could do, and this is largely a state level reform, is remove some of those regulatory barriers. I'm glad you mentioned the background checks earlier. That's one that makes sense for a provider to have in place. What does not make sense are things like, in Washington, D.C., extremely low two to one infant to teacher ratios uh, in a classroom, or even worse, a bachelor's degree requirement for lead teachers in D.C. Washington, D.C. is the only place where there is a bachelor's requirement for these lead teachers that significantly increases the cost of providing care. And yet, typically, the Heritage Foundation would argue that states should be able to make up their own rules and regulations. Absolutely. Which is what, what they wanted done in D.C. So. Sure, of course. But if D.C. wanted to make their market more affordable, they should look at the regulatory landscape and the regs that they've layered on to those providers we know do not improve care. They simply drive up costs and limit choices for families. I would also have to say, I don't think we can say out of that, this is not the federal government's responsibility. The responsibility of our nation is to form a more perfect union. And if lifting up our children is part of forming a more perfect union, that would be our responsibility. Speaker Martinez, uh, I was just meeting today with the head of injuries at CDC who pointed out that adverse child experiences, ACEs, are closely linked with depression and suicide ideation among adolescents and, and young adults. What have you done in New Mexico on adverse childhood experiences? Um, th Congressman, thank you for that question. Uh, it is a very important one for a place like New Mexico. Um, in New Mexico, we have, uh, we have 23 independent sovereign tribes, tribal nations, um, and, and many of them uh, produce some of the most beautiful pottery you've ever seen. A child's brain, 80% of it develops before the age of three. Imagine a potter in New Mexico forming this beautiful uh, piece of pottery. And before it dries, in come these holes that are poked and made into this piece of pottery. Once it dries, those holes make it so that that piece of pottery can't hold water. For many, many years, that's what happened in New Mexico in our children. The rate of adverse childhood experiences ranked among some of the highest in the nation. These adverse childhood experiences could be exposure to domestic violence, could be poverty, hunger, crime, drug abuse in the household. So when our children start kindergarten, their little brains are impacted and sometimes permanently by these adverse childhood experiences. It is the purpose of a robust and comprehensive early education system to help offset those adverse childhood experiences. Uh, New Mexico is not alone. I think states in general that experience high rates of poverty will have children who experience high rates of adverse childhood experience, ACEs for short is what we call them. Uh, without addressing and without mitigating those risk factors, Children are in fact on a path toward many times self-destruction, be it drug abuse, be it involvement in the criminal justice system, be it that they become offenders themselves of the same things that impacted them. That's where issues and concepts like multi, uh, generational poverty, cycles of poverty, cycles of abuse come into play. New Mexico has a very unique history, 500 years of conquest, from when the Spaniards first arrived through the Mexican period, the territorial period, and now the United States of America. And we have people who have lived on that land for thousands of years, long before this country was founded. It is those people sometimes that still are dealing with that historical and generational trauma 
as represented by those adverse childhood experiences that many of those children to this day continue to live with. That is the role of government in my state. That is my plight and my journey as Speaker of the House of, the, of Representatives in New Mexico is to create a system that helps alleviate exposure and mitigate the risk factors for our children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, very much. I mean, I recognize the gentle lady, the Congresswoman from California, Ms. Porter. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by talking about other people's money. Because last time I checked, that's all we spend, is the American people's money. That's actually the function of Congress. And there are no dollars that we spend that do not come from the American people. So the argument that we shouldn't do something because it's spending other people's money would simply suggest that we don't spend any money at all, including zeroing out the defense budget. Is that in fact what you were suggesting, Dr. Burke, that we zero out the defense budget so that we don't spend other people's money? Uh, no, but it is the case right. that- I just want to, I'm reclaiming my time. You are spending other people's money. Always. And that, and that those choices need to reflect what most Americans want. Okay. Most Americans do reclaiming not want my government time, Mr. Chair. universal child Reclaiming care. my time. This is not a hearing about federally mandated Head Start. I don't know what you're talking about. This is actually not what this hearing is about. This is a hearing about the economic and individual investments and returns and benefits, both to the future generation of American children, as well as to our ongoing current economy. There are lots of ways that we could deliver this. Like Representative Beyer, I have had lots of different kinds of arrangements. Universal, to quote what Ms. Boteyek said, doesn't mean the same. Universal means that the funding, the outcome, the choice is there and available. If, if we had universal health care in this country, and we don't, some people might choose to go get a colonoscopy every year, and a lot of people won't. It's the same thing with child care. I personally have had my children in big corporate care. I have had them hourly in home, part-time. I have had full-time live-in. I have been in a family-owned small business, and I have had in-home um, family-based care. All of it. And you know what it all was? Really helpful. Particularly as a single mother. Because there is no other person. Senator Vance's hypothetical says that one parent might prefer to stay home. That's probably true. There's a lot of statistics that show that parents, men and women, have different preferences at different points in time. But what about the 10 million single moms? Where do they fit? Dr. Burke, where did you put your children in childcare? Well, I'm not going to bring my children into this hearing, so it doesn't have any bearing on this. So Dr. Burke, do you matter. have children? I do. So I'm sharing my story because my story is one that doesn't get heard in this Congress. Because do you know how many single moms there are? One or two? <laughs> one. Child care, custodial care to help people who may choose all kinds of different options. I've had full-time care. I've had three-fourths care. I had a stay when I had a spouse. He stayed home some years. That was how we fit the pieces together. But that's what this hearing is about, not jamming one size fits all. But if there isn't the money, there won't be the choice. That's why we see married parents saying they would prefer to stay home, because they have the option to stay home. Single parents don't say they'd rather stay home because they couldn't. So. Our whole perspective here is warped by the fact that this body is so disproportionately unrepresentative of the American people's experience. It is absolutely Congress's job to spend the American people's money. And if we can't spend it to help the next generation of American workers, I don't know what the hell we're doing here. I yield back. Can I respond quickly to that? No, she actually cannot. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Burke. Right. We appreciate it. But, um, I want to acknowledge that Senator Haston was here um, and had to go to another meeting. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining this conversation 
about the benefits and the controversies of investing in early childhood education. Investing in early childhood education, we believe, has lasting benefits for children, teachers, businesses, and society as a whole. And ensuring quality early childhood education while supporting workers in a sector has never been more vital for families and the economy. I'm proud of the progress Senator Heinrich I know is with, in New Mexico, uh, yet there's still a lot of work to be, to be done by all of us, including the federal government, to ensure that everyone has access to quality early childhood education. So I'd like to thank each of our panelists for their contribution to this ongoing discussion. Thank you to my colleagues, Ms. Porter, for being part of this important discussion. Questions for the record may be submitted after the hearing, and the record will remain open for three business days. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.